So we had some questions concerning dosing and parameters and what do we really do on these larger aquariums like the 6,000 up in Atlanta. It's a big body of water to go in there and make enough bioavailable calcium. I mean, that's the idea. You want bioavailable calcium. There's a lot of ways to do it, but one that has been proven time in and time again is a calcium reactor. That particular one, we have a very large Deltec calcium reactor that's been on there for the four years that it's been in place. You set the drip and you test the effluent coming out to get a really high calcium rate coming outbound, but you also want to make sure that the water that's coming out of there is either going into the protein skimmer or going into an area with a lot of agitation so you're releasing CO2. You can get a lot of built up CO2 if you're not careful, and that really isn't a good thing. You really want to try to limit the CO2 and keep your pH elevated. A lot of the ways to do that is via a calc stirrer that we've used there the entire time, and a lot of times we'll set that calc stirrer to go off in the evening after the lights have been going down, which is really your highest peak position, is when your lights have been going uh, on for all day, they start to scale down, your pH is probably at about 8.3, and then it'll start to scale back uh, going into 10, 11, midnight, and then by the morning, it might be down at 8.1 or 8.0. That's the time really to put the calc washer in, in the evening hours and stabilize or flatline, I'd call it, that pH at an 8.2 or an 8.4. That's really very important. Between the calc washer and the calcium reactor, you can achieve a, a high alkalinity of a minimum of eight to really a nine. Our goal is there, a calcium level anywhere from 375, 380 to 450 is acceptable. That usually will stay stabilized too with the addition of both going in there at one time. So with the dosing in such a large aquarium, you really have to stabilize magnesium. You need to uh, look at strontium, molybdenum, barium, all these minor elements that need to be dealt with. And a lot of times we'll put an auto doser going in there with either a Camora or a JBJ doser or some sort. Most likely at this point, I think we've, we've transitioned all of those to a dose system from Neptune that's on the, the controller. We're dosing those as to what the ICP test comes back to keep those again stabilized on a consistent basis. So we'll, we'll use DSR, We'll use uh, Julian's Acro Power uh, with the aminos in the aquarium for the stony corals too, and also the soft corals. The DSR has a good amount of iodine, which also is another very important element to have in there so that you keep the color, and it's, it's super important not to have a low iodine level too. And then going into carbon dosing, we've done it on numerous aquariums through time. What we've really found is you're, you're doing carbon dosing to alleviate nitrate buildup. Uh, water changes is the, the common, normal thing that people use. We use a lot of tropic marin salt, so we have a lot of good elemental, solid elements within the, the high quality tropic marin salt. So that really helps out a lot too, but you're going to deal with nitrates in a couple ways. We put a couple clear water scrubbers on that, the commercial size double rack units. So there's actually four of the, of the larger units on that aquarium and that absorption through microalgal growth that runs 24 seven is also helping to keep nitrates down significantly and obviously phosphate too. And we recommend keeping nitrates somewhere around 10 ppms. So in these really large aquariums, you can't get nitrates out of balance. You, you, you end up wanting a lot of fish. The client loves the fish, the activity of the fish at feeding time. And you got to give them enough food to keep them satiated, but also healthy with a balanced diet. We'll take some of the frozen foods and soak those in Vitachem Marine Formula and use that for feeding when you're doing hand feeding. But in those particular aquariums, we have auto dosers of the uh, reef nutrition branded, different types of foods that are in a bottle. They're in a small refrigerator. Those are also auto-dosed with the dose system um, going in several times a day. When you think about the reef and the fish out on the reef, the first light, they're looking for food <laughs> or trying not to get eaten. And all day long, that's what they do. They pick on the reef, they go all over and they're eating. So 
that's really what they should be doing in an aquarium. You need to give them food more on a regular, consistent basis through a day than just one feeding in the morning or one big pollution feeding at the end of the day. Feeding them, you know, four times metered is way better. Uh, the same thing goes with corals. Corals really eat at night. So you might be using the, the oyster feeds from, I guess it's the oyster pearls from uh, uh, Reef Nutrition and other foods, maybe rotifers or live feeds or green water. A lot of that you want to feed at night so you'll notice the corals open up. But at nighttime, you know, you go to these aquariums when the lights are off and you get a a red flashlight out and you can see the polyps coming out of the coral stinging the other ones as well. Even in our big reef here, there's that uh, sprung stunner over there and that thing's got sweet botanicals. I know Josh is gonna cut that back a bit, but the sweet botanicals you can see are stinging some of the corals down current from it. Some of the other elements that we deal with is mechanics. I mean, how do you do the engineering? What do you do with all the plumbing and drainage and wastewater, clean water and temperature and humidity control? There's just so many elements of a big aquarium. Um, one of the large things people think about, especially in the South and anywhere you are really, you need to consider yourself with temperature control. In the north, heating to me is a lot easier. You can put a titanium large uh, heater in a sump and control temperature that way. Um, of course, stabilizing air temperature is key and humidity is also key. But in the south, you really need chillers. We have installed, I can't imagine, hundreds and hundreds of Aquologic chillers. It's the brand I've typically used through time for larger installations. Those are just super nice units. They've got to be installed by a professional. You have your, your thermostat right here. I usually have that set at about a one degree differential. You have your barrel that is a big coil of titanium. If you opened up the ends, you'd see a big coil of a titanium uh, inside of there. And here's your float switch to make sure water is going through it. We're sending uh, the flow through it. It's, it's sized accordingly and it has, a, it has a chart on how much water needs to go through the unit on a regular basis. You need constant water flow. If the water goes off, the pump gets clogged, the power goes off, this switch will turn the unit off, which is a sensor to the condensing unit out, outside. So the gas, the Freon gas and all, doesn't keep going through. So the titanium comes through the PVC barrel here and then it's connected to the copper right here. And that's your line set that goes outside. And we have our um, compressor a ton and a half outside that's connected to this. So your heat load is dissipating outside of the building. Other times we use water to water coolers. So if you're in a chilled water loop in a building, uh, like we had at the Smithsonian, and I even have at the Jellyfish Aquarium at the W Hotel, there's a chill, chilled water loop in the building that has water typically going from 47 to maybe even 55 degrees. That's really cold water. That's how they air condition the building with a chilled water loop. So we can use that chilled water loop the same way with a thermostat and a solenoid, and that'll shut the cold water off and keep a stable temperature profile that you're looking for. We're running 79 to 78, that's our swing here. The area underneath your aquarium or above your aquarium should be as close to the same temperature as your room, which normally in somebody's house might be 74 degrees, could be you know 72, could be 76 maybe, but most people don't keep their houses at 80 degrees, it's just too hot. So there's lots of questions out there and we look forward to helping you guys out with your reef aquarium at home too.